Wanna play? Wanna play? Wanna play? Wanna play? Wanna play? Wanna play? Hey everybody, welcome back to Wanna Play. My name is James McKenna and it is finally time. I've ranked six different franchises. Dracula, Frankenstein, The Wolfman, The Mummy, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, and The Invisible Man have all been individually ranked as their own separate franchises and all of those videos have been leading up to this. My ultimate ranking of all 30 Universal Monsters films. Now, luckily for you, I go super in-depth in my little individual franchise rankings. I go super in-depth on each movie. Pretty much to save all of you watching this, two hours of your life so I'm not talking in-depth about every single one of these movies. I'm going to try and cap my explanation off of these films to maybe like a minute or so each, just so we're not here for two hours long. So, without any further ado, it is now time to rank all 30 Universal Monster movies. So, without any further ado, let's get straight into it. So, coming in in last place, at number 30, is one that I knew was going to be ranked here since the first time I watched it. The third Creature from the Black Lagoon film, The Creature Walks Among Us. This movie is so stupid because they take they, they take a water animal a prehistoric water monster and put him on land and somehow give him a surgery so he becomes a land creature and he just looks so stupid he's like walking down a hallway and he's just like big and they, they like redesign his whole face his whole appearance and it's just so stupid he looks ridiculous, the, the story is stupid, it's ridiculous, and it's just, it's a terrible idea for a sequel to ruin your, your, your franchise's main monster in this way. So for me, at number 30 is going to be The Creature Walks Among Us. At number 29 is going to be The Invisible Man's Revenge. Now, this is really one of the only movies in the Universal Monsters box set that is just as forgettable as it is. It's the second to last Invisible Man movie, and it brings absolutely nothing new to the table to the point where, standing here now, I can't remember the name of a single character in this entire movie, and I don't even remember what it's about. It's just so forgettable. It does absolutely nothing new. It's just another, oh, here's a guy who turns invisible and goes crazy and it's not as good as the other movies and it's just it's just the most forgettable one in the entire box set of all of the Universal Monsters films so for me it's going to be number 29. Number 28 is going to be Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. This one is just stupid. The mummy looks terrible as I said in my ranking he just looks like a dude with shaving cream sprayed all over him. He looks really stupid. The, the gags in this movie just aren't funny and especially aren't as funny as the other two Abbott and Costello movies because this is their second to last movie as a duo together and it, it really shows. This movie is just bad and it just doesn't make any sense story-wise. It's just, it's just all over the place. There's like an amulet for some reason that like controls the mummy and, and they get possession of it but then somehow it just it, it's so bad and, and inconsistent and just weird and it's supposed to be a comedy and it, and it just fails at that. This is not a great movie at all and for me it's going to be at number 28. At number 27 is going to be Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man. Now I said in my previous entry that this film is funnier than Abbott and Costello meet the Mummy and that's pretty much the only reason why it's ranked any higher than that movie because this movie just feels kind of weird and out of place because it's not a horror movie at all. I'm not exactly sure why they even included this movie because it's it's just not a horror movie. It really, it barely has any tiebacks to the original Invisible Man and it's more of a boxing movie than a horror movie because the whole premise is that one of the comedians 
is a boxer and he uses the guy who's invisible to actually fight for him. So, you know, they're in the ring and these guys are getting knocked around and the, the comedian, I forget which one, Fitz Abbott or Costello, isn't even moving a muscle. And that's the whole movie. It's just, it's not really that funny. It's not really all that creative. Like, obviously this would have been a premise for an Abbott and Costello meet an Invisible Man movie. Like, they didn't even, like, try. Like, oh, Invisible Guy fighting other people for him. Like, come on. It, you could have done something better with this concept. And I just think that this movie kind of flopped on what it should have been. So for me, it's going to be a number 27. At number 26 is the first movie that I would consider to be a good movie, and that is The Mummy's Curse. This movie overall isn't the most memorable or rewatchable movie in the series, but I think that it has a collection of moments that make it stand out. I think that Ananka and the actress who played her actually does really well with the character, and Karis is, is cool as well. He's not the best in the Mummy franchise, but he's fine. But pretty much everything else is a little bit, you know, a little bit forgettable. It's not as big and as crazy and as ambitious as the other Mummy films, and it's also just one that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. I mean, when you're ranking this many good movies, there's gonna be some unfortunate placements in the ranking list, and I feel like this is one of them. This is by no means a bad movie, it's just that I feel like the other movies are a little more memorable and a little better than this one was. So for me, The Mummy's Curse is going to be number 26. Coming in at number 25 is going to be House of Frankenstein. Now this one is kind of interesting that it's placed this low because it's a crossover between Frankenstein, Dracula, kind of, and The Wolfman. But it's just not very good. I said kind of when I said Dracula because Dracula just gets killed off almost in the opening. He, he just, just unceremoniously dies and it's, he's played by a guy who never played him before. So it's just they bring in this random dude to play Dracula and then kill him off just, just because why not? And it's just not the best story. It's not the best and most compelling and most gripping way to bring these guys together. Obviously the monsters are great in their roles, but just the story is all kind of weird and all the subplots going on I'm just not really a fan of. And it's also kind of odd because it stars Boris Karloff, but Boris Karloff isn't playing Frankenstein. Why? Like, what? Like, just, just make him, have him play Frankenstein. There's no reason for him not to, so. Yeah, it's just, it's just a weird movie, so it's gonna be number 25. Coming in at number 24 is gonna be the sequel to House of Frankenstein, and that is House of Dracula. This one kind of suffers from the same negatives that House of Frankenstein has. It's just, it doesn't really have that memorable or gripping of a story. The only thing that I think really elevates it over House of Frankenstein is that House of Frankenstein, it has a little bit more problems and a little bit more flaws than this one. And also Dracula doesn't die as early on. Again, he dies again for some reason. They bring him back, played by the same actor who played him in House of Frankenstein and died in House of Frankenstein. They bring him back. They have him go on a police chase. So there's, there's a police chase scene with Count Dracula, and then he kind of just like dies, he just gets like fried in the sun about 30 minutes in, and Frankenstein's monster is almost just completely insignificant in this movie, like they, they, they summon him in the last like five minutes, and he just like kind of throws a guy out a window, and that's kind of it. So really this movie is, it's pretty similar to House of Frankenstein, but almost just because Dracula lives a couple minutes longer, that couple of minutes was enough to elevate this up one more spot. At number 23 is going to be The Invisible Man Returns. 
This one is an alright movie. It's another one that's kind of like The Mummy's Curse though. It's not a bad movie by any means, but it's a little bit more forgettable and the other Invisible Man movies and the other Universal Monster movies are just more memorable and are a little bit better than this one. But again, this one, it's definitely not bad, especially the Invisible Man. This might be the best casted Invisible Man character besides the original because it's Vincent Price. Vincent Price plays the Invisible Man in this movie and yeah. He, he has some good moments and, and cool lines, but there's really nothing overly memorable that makes this movie stand out amongst the pack. There's no scene in this that's like, oh, hell yeah, that is definitely easily one of the best scenes or moments in this entire ranking list. So, again, it's not a bad movie, but the other movies just have more going on for them. So for me, this is going to come in at number 23. Coming in at number 22 is going to be She-Wolf of London. This is a movie that it seems like a lot of people aren't the biggest fan of, especially, you know, comparing it to all the other Universal Monsters, and I can definitely see why, but I actually did appreciate this movie. It's a werewolf movie that you never actually get to see the werewolf and throughout the whole movie you're like okay what, what's going on where's the werewolf who is the werewolf it's almost like a mystery of who's the werewolf rather than actually seeing some wolfman action itself and it pretty much tells you the whole movie that the main character is the werewolf and she's kind of going crazy but in a shock twist it turns out that her like evil stepmother or something was killing people in the park and framing her for it instead so she could get arrested and kicked out of her house because she doesn't like her. It's a cool twist, it's a unique little movie, it's only an hour long so for me it's harmless. It's not a terrible movie, it's not a waste of time because of how short it is. If this was more dragged out then it would definitely be lowered down but they knew what they were doing, they were in and they were out so this movie's alright and for me it comes in at number 22. At number 21 is going to be Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Now this movie is awesome. The only thing that it really suffers from is kind of the first half not being as iconic as the second half because the first half is pretty much just getting it all set up. They're not like fighting throughout the whole movie so you know they, they have the whole setup but the ending fight is awesome. Just Frankenstein and the Wolfman just going at it clashing, colliding, and just wailing on each other in the burning Castle Frankenstein. It's awesome. It's a really cool fight, and it's a really cool payoff. The only problem is that I feel like it's a little bit too short. If they had started fighting a little bit sooner than they did, then this movie would be ranked probably a little bit higher. But just like the setup took a little bit too long, in my opinion, it took a little bit too much of the runtime to get them to where they finally started fighting. But the fight scene is definitely enough to bring it up at least at number 21. Coming in at number 20 is gonna be Son of Dracula. This is another one kind of like The Invisible Man Returns in that it doesn't have too many huge moments that make it stand out amongst the pack, but it's not a bad movie at all. This is a Dracula movie made about a decade or so after the original came out, so there was a lot more camera trickery that could be done to make Dracula seem more mysterious and magical, and I think that they use it to their effect. Like, there are scenes where Dracula's actually, like, floating over a river, and there's a scene where Dracula, like, kind of forms through a dust cloud, and just stuff like that I feel like elevates this one to the spot at number 20 because it has the best visual effects of all of these films with of course the exception of the Invisible Man movie. It's got some pretty good visual effects for the time and I think that Lon Chaney is great as Dracula. He plays pretty much all the monsters and he's never really bad in the role so for me, Son of Dracula is going to come in at number 20. At number 19 is going to be The Invisible Woman. Now this one has a complete tonal shift from the first two movies, and I think that it's a nice breath of fresh air for the series. This is, instead of 
another loony dude going crazy after becoming invisible. It's instead a completely different story about a mad scientist trying to make this kind of invisibility machine and he brings in this girl who's got this really annoying and like misogynistic boss that wants, you know, she wants revenge on this guy. So he brings this girl in to experiment on her and then she escapes and then of course you get the scene where she pretty much terrifies him to his core and makes him, you know, become a, a better person. And then after that, it starts to fall off the rails a little bit. There's just kind of some other kind of random stuff, because that's the main plot, but that wraps up pretty quickly. So then after that, it gets a little bit... It gets a little bit forgettable. There's not, there's not a whole hell of a lot that goes on afterwards, but that initial, you know, main center storyline is pretty cool and it's pretty unique and it's a breath of fresh air and the invisible woman herself is pretty funny she's cracking some one-liners here and there and she's a great character so for me the invisible woman is going to come in at number 19. at number 18 is going to be the sequel to dracula and that is dracula's daughter i think that the only thing that really could have made this Better is, of course, actually having Dracula in this movie, but everything other than that is pretty cool. You do get some returning characters from Dracula, Van Helsing being one of them, but you also get some new characters like, of course, Dracula's daughter herself, and she does great. I just think that all of the references to the original and how this is very much a direct sequel, like we visit the same set pieces, is really cool, and this is a really cool little follow-up to the original Dracula that's pretty unknown, pretty much because Bela Lugosi's not in it, but as I said, Dracula's daughter herself is actually pretty cool and she's pretty compelling. Of course, she's no Bela Lugosi, but this is a solid little follow-up to Dracula if you weren't going to bring Bela Lugosi back. So for me, it comes in at number 18. <laughs> Coming in at number 17 is going to be Ghost of Frankenstein. Now this is one that I was a little bit hesitant about at first because, you know, it's the first Frankenstein without Boris Karloff. So I didn't really know what I was going to come out of this movie thinking. But after I watch it, I can definitely tell you that this is a solid follow-up to the original Frankenstein trilogy. Of course, it, it's no Frankenstein, it's no Bride, it's no Son of Frankenstein, but it's pretty good. It's a pretty good segue from the original trilogy to kind of the campier movies that come later, like, you know, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman and all that. And I feel like this, this movie is shot pretty well, and it's shot pretty competently, and it's got some good moments and good scenes and good scares. Ultimately, it doesn't compare to the original three Frankenstein movies, but it's got enough going for it to where it's really not a bad movie at all, and I would recommend it to any fan of the original trilogy. Just don't get your hopes up too high that this is going to be anything incredibly special like the original three were. So for me, Ghost of Frankenstein is going to be number 17. <laughs> At number 16 is going to be Invisible Agent. Now this one takes the Invisible Man and puts him in the army. And I think that that's a pretty awesome way to go. Of course he's not like an evil villain, like they're not throwing Jack Griffin in the army, but they take Jack Griffin's spell and use it as a weapon. And I think you've got some pretty unique scenes in this movie that do stand out with that premise. Like there's a scene where he literally jumps out of an airplane like a fighter jet, dude jumps out of it in parachutes and literally disappears in midair, just like vanishes right there, and it's awesome. You get some really cool scenes, like this is a movie that took its potential with its premise and lived up to it. This movie is really awesome, it's another great breath of fresh air for this series, and it's just a really unique horror movie that's, again, pretty unknown and I would recommend to a lot of people. So for me, it's going to be number 16. Coming in at number 15 is going to be The Mummy's Tomb. I think that this movie is pretty good and I think it's really the only good movie that, you know, is one of those, oh, half of it is a flashback to the previous movie films, you know. Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, and Puppet Master The Legacy are the other more notable ones. But this one, yeah, it's pretty much like a 15-minute clip show of 
the original The Mummy's Hand, or at least the sequel. It's, the Mummy's Hand is, is kind of a sequel, kind of not a sequel, but yeah, this is pretty much a lot of flashbacks to that, but once it gets into the main story, it's really cool, and it's paced real well because there's really only 45 minutes left, and you get some unique moments. It's not the worst mummy, it's not the worst portrayal, and it's pretty good within that 45 minutes. The only thing that could have made it better is that, of course, the first 15 minutes weren't just a clip show. But what we did get moving on from that was good enough, I think, to at least secure a spot at number 15. And number 14 is going to be The Mummy's Ghost. This movie is awesome. It's Lon Chaney's best portrayal of The Mummy, and I think it's his best look as Karras. And it's got some really, really cool scenes. You've got John Carradine, who was the guy who played Dracula in House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula, and he actually gets to show off his skills here because he doesn't die in the first 15 or 20 minutes. He's awesome, and I think that he plays kind of the Paul Bear to the Mummy's Undertaker, the guy who controls the Mummy through the power of the urn or whatever they use in this film. And I think he portrays him really well. Just the smugness that he has combined with the crazy badassery and unstoppability of Karras in this film. Like, he gets shot so many times and just, like, continues to kill people left and right. This movie is awesome. It's a great mummy movie, although it isn't the best mummy movie. And for me, it's number 14. Coming in at number 13 is going to be The Mummy's Hand, the third mummy movie in a row. And this movie is awesome. I think that besides the original, this is by far the best look of The Mummy. He looks intimidating, he looks brutal, and he looks badass. The original Mummy. The Mummy wasn't really wrapped up in bandages throughout the whole movie. He was, of course, in the classic opening, but he wasn't the whole time. That's what makes the original so unique. So I think that of the actual bandaged up, wrapped up Mummy movies, this is easily the best. We get some great kills, and The Mummy is shot to look huge, imposing, menacing, and unstoppable to the point where it really doesn't compare to the other Mummy movies, except the first one. So for me, Mummy's Hand is actually really good. It's got some great atmosphere, it's got some really cool scenes throughout this film, really cool kill scenes, really cool shot moments, and for me, it's gonna be number 13. At number 12, we've got the original The Creature from the Black Lagoon. The first of the original entries in the series, and that's not a slight at all against this movie because I think that all of the original Universal Monster movies are classics. Like, there is absolutely no doubt that every single movie from here on up is just a bona fide classic that is almost objectively wrong if you think that this is a bad movie. I'm not saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that if you don't like any of these movies, there's you might want to check yourself. The Creature from the Black Lagoon is awesome. It's an introduction to one of the most legendary horror characters of all time. It's in the era of all these crazy over-the-top monsters, and then along comes this crazy fish dinosaur terrorizing everyone in some of the coolest moments in the entire series. There's a reason why this movie is a classic, because it's simply awesome, and for me, it's gonna be number 12. Coming in at number 11, and again, just like with The Creature from the Black Lagoon, it is absolutely not a slight that this is an original, but isn't in the top 10, and that is The Wolfman. Between this movie's just fantastic atmosphere and star-studded cast, especially with Lon Chaney coming into his own here, playing the Wolfman, one of the most iconic horror characters of all time. This movie is absolutely phenomenal. Bella Lugosi's running around in it, and just the storyline that we get is just so memorable, and it's so great, and it's so gripping. This is the first one that is really like an actual gripping story, which is what the Universal Monsters are mainly known for. He's such a nuanced villain, and he's really not a villain at all. He's just a guy who kind of stumbled across this crazy curse, and it, it makes for an absolutely incredible movie. And for me, The Wolfman is easily 
gonna be ranked this high up at number 11. It's time for the top 10 now, and we're kicking it off with the original werewolf movie, Werewolf of London. This one might not be as classic and as well known as the original The Wolfman, but I think it's honestly just as good, if not a little bit better, which is why it's ranked one spot higher. It was actually a really difficult call whether to rank The Wolfman higher or Werewolf of London higher, but I've gone with Werewolf of London because I feel like just the way that it was shot is almost more creative than the original The Wolfman. Just some of the transition scenes were done slightly better than the original Wolfman, and that's really all that it came down to. The original Wolfman, of course, it's from the 40s, so it's gonna be dated. It's it's not, it's not rocket science that I have to explain, like, yes, it's dated. But this movie kind of knew that it really wasn't... Like, the film wasn't at the point where it's where we have these crazy CGI and practical ways to make these world transformations, so they get creative with it. Every time he, like, walks by a pole, for example, he'll walk by it and he'll be more transformed, and he'll walk by it and be more transformed, and it's just cool the way that this movie was shot and how creative and unique it was, and it's really the first werewolf movie, so for me, this movie's pretty good, it's pretty classic, and it's pretty underrated, and it's gonna come in at number 10. Number 9 is gonna be The Phantom of the Opera. This is gonna be difficult to keep to a minute, because this is the only one that I didn't get to talk about because it doesn't have its own franchise. So let me just tell you right now, this movie is absolutely fantastic. I, I had to rewatch it because I remember really not liking it all that much, and I have no idea why, because this movie is awesome. Claude Rains plays the Phantom to absolute perfection, and although it does take some time getting there, once he's going full psycho phantom mode, it's awesome. You get like a chase scene through the rafters, and the craziest moment is when this dude literally saws a giant chandelier in the opera house and crashes a giant chandelier down on this entire audience and flattens them all. It's the craziest kill scene in the entire Universal Monsters set. And just, this movie is so good. It's so good, it's so gripping, and all the performances are fantastic. Claude Rains was perfectly cast in this role. His voice and the way he presents himself is unlike any other. And this movie is awesome. It needed, it absolutely needed to make the top 10. At number 8 is gonna be The Mummy, an absolute horror classic, and I think the reason because of it is because it's not like the other Mummy movies. Whereas the other Mummy movies are almost like precursors to slasher films, where it's just this big lumbering dude going around killing people controlled by some other guy, this movie is way more nuanced, and The Mummy actually has a plan, and he's smarter. And it reminds you a lot of Dracula because the way he carries himself and the way he talks and the way that he can, like, possess people. Like, this wasn't based off of a book. This is a completely original story. So it's really no surprise that the mummy is more... is more developed of a character and is more magic in the way that he is. Like, he's literally, like, possessing people just like Dracula would and just... I think the reason why it's ranked so high is because it is so similar to the original Dracula, and as you'll see by that movie's placement, is I love that movie. And this movie just is so great. Boris Karloff is amazing as the mummy, his makeup is awesome, and the way that he was shot is perfect. This movie is awesome, and it's easily number 8 on the list. Number seven is going to be Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. The fact that this movie isn't in the top five is just a testament to how unbelievably good the rest of these movies are because this movie is flawless. Like every movie from here on up is flawless. It's the only movie that got all of the Universal Monsters coming together in like a crossover movie. It's the only one that got it right. And my god, they got it to perfection. Frankenstein, despite not being played by Boris Karloff, was awesome. The Wolfman being played by Lon Chaney is maybe the best Wolfman we ever got with some of the best Wolfman transformations. 
and they finally brought Bela Lugosi back to play Dracula, and the only other time he played the character in cinema besides the original movie. And it all comes together in just the perfect way. I absolutely recommend this movie to every fan of the Universal Monsters. It's perfect. It was preserved in the U.S. Library of Congress for a damn reason, because it is flawless. It just is. And for me, it's going to be number seven. At number six is a movie that absolutely shocked me to my core about how unbelievably good it was. It's Revenge of the Creature. The sequel to The Creature from the Black Lagoon is so good. It is so good. Just the story that they came up with to bring the creature back and how they turn the creature into almost an anti-hero and they turn the humans into the bad guys without explicitly saying it. Like, the humans were presented as almost like the main characters. So they were presented as, oh, we're supposed to root for these guys. And they're not really bad people. Like, they're not out to kill anybody. But just the way that the movie was written and told lets you know that on the surface, it may seem like that these humans are the good guys, but just rest assured, the creature is going to break out of this prison and he will have his revenge. Because basically it's like they take him out of his habitat and they kind of put him in this aquarium and you the way it's shot is like you feel bad for the creature and you feel bad and you're, you're annoyed at these humans who really aren't doing anything to harm other people but they're taking this creature out of its natural habitat and when it finally breaks free of its chain and starts killing everyone the rest of the movie after that is perfect the way that the creature gets his revenge slowly goes through all of the main characters after this massive crazy scene of him like running through all the people at the aquarium itself this movie is awesome this movie is flawless and this movie comes in at number six at number five is going to be bride of frankenstein of course the first sequel to the original frankenstein and the movie that brought back boris karloff as the monster and of course colin clive as frankenstein himself this movie is another one that I'm pretty sure we can all agree is just completely flawless. This movie has a solid 100% score on Rotten Tomatoes. There is not a single person in this world that doesn't like this movie. It is literally perfect. Like there's literally nothing wrong with it and there's really nothing else I gotta say. There's so many great scenes that have the monster kind of portrayed as the anti-hero of the story, but it never gets to the point to where it starts to feel forced, or where this giant killing machine is actively like the hero of the movie. But there is some like nuanced little scenes that make you understand like this guy, he wasn't asked to be here and he wasn't asked to be programmed this way, and you start to feel bad for him. This is maybe the most emotional movie in the entire Universal Monsters set, and for me, it's just perfect, and it comes in at number five. Number four is probably the most iconic movie out of all of these. That's the original Frankenstein. Again, this movie's just flawless. Like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, and I love it. There, I, I, like, I can't say anything bad about this movie. The casting is perfect, the atmosphere is perfect, and I think that it has easily the greatest kill in the entire series as well, Maria's death, the little girl, where Frankenstein literally, in 1931, throws this girl into the lake, and it's just such a shocking scene. Just the way everything was done, of course, the It's Alive scene where Frankenstein first comes to life, might just be the most classic scene in horror movie history. This movie is an all-time classic that transcends the horror genre and for a damn good reason because this is a damn good movie and for me it's gonna be number four. At number three is gonna be The Invisible Man. 
I think the only reason why this is ranked higher than Frankenstein is because the Invisible Man is just a cooler villain than Frankenstein's monster because he's insane. It's of course a story about this normal scientist, he drinks a potion, becomes invisible, and becomes absolutely insane. When I say becomes insane, I mean it. Like, this isn't no, oh, you know, Frankenstein, he like throws a girl in the river by mistake. No, this guy's tipping over trains. He's throwing people's cars off cliffs and exploding them. He's throwing people themselves off of cliffs with his bare hands. And just the charisma and the awesome look and everything that Claude Rains does in the role of the Invisible Man is absolutely perfect. There's nobody, nobody else that could have taken on this role quite like he did. And just the effects of this movie, the kills, how badass and, and amazing he delivers his lines. This movie is just so good. And for me, it comes in. At number two, and people might be a little bit shocked to see this movie this high, but I truly believe it. And it's Son of Frankenstein. This movie right here is my favorite horror movie sequel ever. Bar none, I think this is by far the best horror movie sequel that we've ever gotten. With really Bride of Frankenstein being its only competition. This movie is so good. The way that Frankenstein is brought back is awesome. And how this one follows Frankenstein's son. Of course, I mean Victor Frankenstein's son because the actor who portrayed him, Colin Clive, in the first and second film, he unfortunately passed away due to alcoholism, so he couldn't reprise his role here. So instead, they had to be the son of Frankenstein returning to the town where his dad created this monster and wreaked havoc in the first two films. And the townsfolk are, of course, they're a little bit weary, but he promises that nothing will happen until he meets Igor, played by Bela Lugosi, who convinces him to bring the monster back, and of course, chaos ensues. I absolutely love this movie. This right here is how you make a sequel. There is absolutely nothing like it. No one has ever done as good with a horror sequel as the creators of Son of Frankenstein. For me, it comes in number two. And at number one is a top five all-time horror film, Dracula. This movie is undeniably the best movie out of all of these. Like, it, it's so good. It's like, it, it, like, I'm speechless talking about how unbelievable this movie is. Like, you just gotta watch it for yourself. It's got maybe the best opening in horror movie history. Dracula's introduction is a top five all-time scene in horror movie history when he walks down the stairs, gives the children of the night line, I am Dracula line. Rainfield is such a good henchman, maybe the best henchman in horror movie history. This movie just has some of the all-time best everything in horror. Like, you name something in horror, like, for example, best henchman, best opening scene, best villain in general. Dracula is always in the conversation, and for a reason, because every single aspect of this movie is flawless. It just absolutely is. There is nothing like Dracula, and it, I think, easily, for me at least, comes in at number one. So thank you for watching my ranking of the Universal Monster movies. Was it worth the wait? I think it was. This video was an absolute blast to record, an absolute blast to research and watch through all 30 of these films, some of them even re-watching and realizing how much I truly, truly love all of these movies. They are, for the most part, all damn near perfect like especially the top couple there's absolutely nothing like those movies absolutely nothing like them because just this whole box set the universal monster movies box set all 30 of these films have something to offer they have something to give and they have such a great story and such and such a great it, it's just so consistent, like it's got a great consistency in the fact that pretty much all of these movies are amazing and you're really not going to see a whole hell of a lot of people hating on a lot of these movies because they just can't. These movies are just too good. So that's all for me for all of these Universal Monster videos and rankings and everything like that. So I want to thank you all very much for watching this video and all of the other Universal Monster videos that I put out over the past couple months. 
So thank you for watching. You can follow me on Instagram at James from Wanna Play, and you can subscribe to this channel if you would like to. But until next time, I want to thank you all very much for watching. Goodbye and good night. Bang.